Today, I'm gonna to show you by far the easiest way to learn programming. This is gonna help you if you're just getting started learning or if you're a full-time professional who just wants to write code faster and with less errors. The tool is called cursor.sh and it's a fork of VS Code, which is one of the most popular code editors on the planet. And so if you're already using VS Code, you can one-click install all of your plugins and preferences over to Cursor. It's super easy to switch. And this isn't a sponsored video or anything. I've just been using this tool now for a couple weeks and I promise you it's going to drastically increase your output. When I started using this tool, I thought it was insane that more people weren't talking about it. It makes programming with the ChatGPT interface feel like the Stone Age. So let's go ahead and jump into it and see how it works. So first of all, what even is Cursor SH? I'll have a link to their website down in the description where you can go and download it for yourself. But basically all it is is a fork of VS Code. You can see when I have my window up here, it looks exactly the same as VS Code, except instead of having my extension bar over there on the left with the icons on the left side of the screen, they're instead on the left at the top of the screen. But again, these are the exact same extensions that you would have access to if you're already using VS Code. The real difference with Cursor SH is over here on the right side of the screen, you're getting access to ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4 to talk to your code base. And as of the recording of this video, at least, Cursor SH is totally free to use. This version I'm using right now, I'm not paying for. So everything that you see in this video should be free access to you as well. And then once you've used a certain amount of access to ChatGPT 4 within Cursor SH, there are paid plans that give you even more access, which if you're hitting those levels of usage, this tool has probably saved you so much time that it's worth the $10 a month or whatever it is to get the paid plan. But again, everything we do in this video is going to be totally free. So let's start first with what I think is the most game changing feature, which is the ability to talk to documentation. So the first thing we're going to do here in cursor, and I think the most powerful feature over just stock chat GPT is your ability to add custom documentation. So all you're going to do to do this is click the at button here and then hit enter on docs. And then down at the bottom here, you're going to click on add new doc. And the documentation that I'm going to choose here is the Gemini API. I've done videos on the Gemini API here on the channel before. So if you want to see how that works, definitely check out the links up in the cards. So I'm just going to copy the high level domain here on docs.gemini.com slash rest API. And it's going to hopefully scrape all of the rest API documentation. And then I will never have to ask ChatGPT again to understand any of Gemini's up to date documentation. I will just have to paste the latest Gemini API reference into cursor.sh here, and then I'm going to hit enter, and then I'll call this Gemini API, and I'll click on confirm. And so now it is learning everything that is in that Gemini API URL that I just sent to it. And you could again do this with whatever custom documentation that you wanted to interact with. And so now instead of having to create a new chat with ChatGPT every time and seeding it with all of this Gemini API reference documentation, I can instead just click at Gemini API and then say, what is the difference between the V1 and V2 ticker endpoints and hit enter. And so now it's going to read the Gemini API documentation that I just gave to it. And it's going to tell me it doesn't provide a direct comparison between the V1 and V2 ticker endpoints. However, by examining the examples and descriptions for the endpoints, we can tell what the differences are. And so while it does that, if we come over here, we can see that the difference between these two endpoints is that the response that the V1 endpoint gives us only has four four pieces of data. And the response that the V2 endpoint gives us has, it looks like six, seven, eight pieces of data. So the response from the V2 endpoint is a lot more robust than the response from the V1 ticker endpoint. And if we come back here, we can see that it basically regurgitated that exact same information to us. The exact same numbers that were available in that Gemini API reference documentation are now available to me within Cursor SH. The biggest problem with programming with just stock chat GPT here is that if you ask it any questions about API documentation that was created after 2021, it just doesn't know about that API. And instead of telling you that it doesn't know about the API, it will actually hallucinate code that looks pretty good. And then when it doesn't work, you're going to be tearing your hair out saying, why isn't this working? There's some name or some number that isn't actually in the API. And so then you have to go look up the API, you know, feed the documentation back to chat GPT, you lose that chat thread. And then ultimately, you've wasted a ton of time when instead, you could just be using cursor SH and permanently 
automatically loading your documentation here into Cursor SH's little docs tab. And then again, if you ever wanted to remove any of this documentation, you could just click on the little gear icon and delete any of the custom documentation that you've added to Cursor SH. So this next tip I found from this guy, Nick Dobos here on Twitter, and he has an entire library of prompts that I'll leave linked down in the description. It's actually super helpful. And it's where I found the examples for this next thing I'm going to show you. So the idea is basically instead of having to pre-seed ChatGPT every time with what you want it to do, instead you can just create markdown files in any of your code libraries. And if there's stuff that you want to seed ChatGPT with over and over again, like these instructions for how it should approach any programming problem, instead of having to manually type that out in the prompt bar every single time, you can just click at and then files and then search for in this case, write code.md. So files and then write code.md. And now instead of having to type that out every time, I can just reference this file and then say maybe I want to build a mortgage calculator. Please give me advice on what libraries to use and create a working of concept in Python. And so then it's going to give you the code, but more importantly, it's going to give you the context around the code to help you ask follow up questions and continue to have a conversation and learn more about the best way to architect your solution. And in Nick's case here online, I think he's an iOS engineer or something. And there are files that need to be structured a certain way in the UI to have it look the same throughout an application. And so instead of having to retell the AI every time what format he wants those files to be in, he can just put that format here in a markdown file and then say at the formatting class.md, please use this format to create this new class that does this new thing. Again, the ability to use at files or at code here is going to be a lot faster than reprompting ChatGPT with this information every single time you want it to learn something new. So far, our strategies that I've shown in this video have been how to kind of outperform ChatGPT by saving time and not having to reseed it with a bunch of things. But next, let's look at some examples that are actually tangible, like how can I better understand code bases that are in front of me? And then how can I quickly make edits to methods or entire code bases to make them do things that they don't currently do? So first of all, let's go back over here to our terminal and click on at and then look at this code file that I created yesterday called fear and greed strategies.py. And I'm going to say, what do these methods do? Please give me examples with different inputs so that I can better understand and see the different outputs. So here it's basically telling me what the difference is between the simple function and the pro version of the function. And it's giving me some sample inputs and outputs for each one of the functions. And so now instead of having to create documentation around all of these things, I can just ask the code base, what do these functions do? And what do the inputs and outputs do? And how could I test these functions? functions and it's just going to tell me. So what these functions do is based on a fear and greed index, whatever that fear and greed index returns, different amounts of Bitcoin are purchased. And so we define a threshold, a factor and an action. And I'm asking ChatGPT that if I had these certain thresholds, factors and actions at each one of these fear and greed index values, how much Bitcoin would be purchased. And so it's saying if the fear and greed index is 10, it's going to be less than 20. So it's going to do 1.5. If it's 30, it's going to be less than 50 and buy one. If it's 70, it's less than 80. So it will buy one half. And if it's 100, it's not going to do anything because 100 is greater than 80. But let's say I wanted to rewrite this function so that every time the fear and greed index was 100, I wanted to buy a static $10 of Bitcoin. What I can do is I can come over here to the editor and I can just highlight this function. And you'll see that I have two options. I have shift command L for add to chat and then I have command K for edit. So let's go ahead and hit on command K. And now I'm getting a prompt right here in the code base. And I can say rewrite this function so that every time the fear and greed index value is 100, we buy a static $10 of Bitcoin and I'll click on enter. And so now in real time, it's going to go through this function and rewrite the function so that if fear and greed index equals 100, buy a static $10 of Bitcoin. And so now I can choose to accept or reject those changes. I'm now in like a merge editor sort of situation where I can say command Y on this block right here, because this is the fear and greed logic kind of that I wanted. So I can hit yes here. And then the next change that it's asking me to do is it's going to delete this red block and replace it with this green block. I'm going to look at them for a second here and it looks like they're actually exactly the same. So maybe it changed some small spacing or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and accept this change as well. And now I have a function that should when fear and greed index is 100 buy a static $10 of Bitcoin. And so this command K feature is super powerful. You can use this on any function and just say, you know, remove the K 
condition where fear and greed index is equal to 100. I don't want that static buy in there anymore. And so between the sidebar, which allows you to sort of understand any code base, you know, very quickly by just having a conversation, and then the command K feature where inside the code, you can literally talk to the code and change it immediately, right? I can just go through and accept these changes. It's basically deleted this top part here. And you do have to use a little bit of discretion when you're making these changes, just so that you're not deleting something that you know that you need, which is where having a baseline understanding of how code works is still going to be very helpful to you. I can just go ahead and accept this change and then quickly look at this and see that nothing really has changed between these two and go ahead and click yes on that also. And now I'm back to my original function. So I think we've covered a lot of really good basics here so far. The last really big thing that I want to show you here is when we click on at, we've covered files, we've covered docs, we've even covered code with that last example of trade fear and greed based on pro. If I do at and I click on code base, now it's going to search this entire code base and give me context on anything that I want to know. So I can at the entire code base and I can say what is the purpose of the fear and greed strategies.py within the context of the entire package. Please give me as much description as possible. Pretend I don't understand any of the code base and need a high level understanding of all the components with as much non-technical description as possible. And if I hit enter here, hopefully it's going to read through all of my files and give me an exact understanding of what this file is doing in context of the broader code base. And again, if you were just doing this with stock chat GPT, I have been for the last like four or five months and copying and pasting every single file over to ChatGPT and then having to recreate entire chat threads and copying and pasting all of that code over and over again. It's very tedious. And this at code base feature has saved me a ton of time so far. And so here you can see exactly what the fear and greed strategies file is doing. So it's part of the Coinbase advanced trader package. This package is a Python client for the Coinbase advanced trade API, which allows users to manage cryptocurrency on Coinbase. This file specifies two methods. It uses the fear and greed index. And here's a high level overview of what both of these functions do. So all of these have been pretty tangible examples of why using cursor is going to be much better than using ChatGPT. As a final example here, I want to show you something pretty crazy that doesn't totally work yet. But if you kind of extrapolate where this is going in the next like, you know, one year, two years, five years, 10 years, I think this is going to get better and better. And it's going to be crazier and crazier. So you can't see it on my screen recording right now, because my monitor is too wide. But if you come up to file and you click on new AI project, you just get this prompt that says, what do you want to build? Prompt the AI with a description of what you'd like to create. The example is build me a multiplayer game of tic-tac-toe using Express and React. Let's just take that exact uh, prompt and say, build me a multiplayer game of chess using Express and React, and then hit next. And we'll give it the folder and we'll give it the project name, cursor AI project chess and we'll click on done. And so now if we just let this run, it's going to go ahead and create all of these files and components. And then you can just sit here and sip on your coffee. It'll be interesting to see if this works. I think it probably won't work. But as you can see, we've generated a ton of code. And you know, is all this code complete crap? Maybe. But I think five years from now, 10 years from now, it's going to not be complete crap. And you're going to with very minimal prompting instructions be able to create something that is pretty meaningful. So you can see all of the steps that it's gone through so far, I'm going to fast forward to the end here. And then we'll try to run the code and see if it actually does let us play chess. So it finished generating all the files, but it looks like it did create some errors here. So if I just hover over this, and I click AI fix and chat, this is actually a maybe a fitting end to this video. So I have used a bunch of prompts throughout this video, I've gotten a ton of value from talking back and forth with ChatGPT and doing my own development before this. And now it's asking me I've used, you know, enough ChatGPT for to have to upgrade to pro so I can go ahead and do that. Or I can switch to ChatGPT 3.5 and continue for free. I'm going to go ahead and click on use chat GPT for an upgrade to pro, we're going to see that pro is $20 a month, you get everything in free plus more generations of chat GPT for basically. And then there's a business thing over here that gives you even more access to uh, chat GPT four, I assume, and maybe some other stuff. So cursor really, really great piece of software, I think the full AI generation of this like chess thing, uh, probably like not always going to work. But ultimately, it's gonna be really cool to see where this software goes in the future. So hopefully all of that was helpful. If you guys want to learn more, I'll leave links in the description to everything that we talked about today, including the Twitter accounts that helped me compile the information for this video. Also in the description, subscribe to the blog for early access to code and videos, I'll be releasing some new code soon for the Coinbase advanced trade API cursor made that development super easy. And I can't wait to share it with you guys. I love you all. See you next week.